Good morning and uh, welcome to the final uh, discussion on Ruskin Bond's All Roads Lead to the Ganga. Now, in our last two uh, sessions, we have talked about how uh, Bond talks about the travelogue as a largely free form of uh, writing in the sense that it can meet it does not have to follow the rigors of the novel or any of that kind of a genre, but can quickly meander across different topics and have a kind of a sprawling breadth. Now, uh, in this particular uh, section, he's already talked about in the earlier sections about his childhood, uh, his place of stay at Musori, Landor Bazaar, the colonial dimensions, He's also talked about in the second section, the river and the uh, tithas or the pilgrimages associated with it. He's talked about the environment, the river, the people, the population, the poverty. And the final segment, which we will discuss today, uh, Bond actually sort of returns to the, uh, the area around Deradu. And uh, he talks about another aspect of the forests. Uh, of the of the hills, I'm sorry, of the mountains. That is the forests, the birds, the sights, the sounds, and the touches that are associated with it. Now, you must be wondering what the point of the travelogue is, since there seems to be no coherent center, as it were. Now, the travelogue is about the Ganga and the kind of topography that the mountains bring. But as we have pointed out, it is equally about Ruskin Bond, his personality, his selfhood, his career, his love for the trees. So in a certain sense, the travelogue begins with Ruskin Bond, his immediate uh, surrounding of Musori, and ends with his perception of the hills, as it were, the mountains, as it were. So in the last segment of the text, again, the Ganga disappears. So it does not appear in the first section. It is centralized in the second section. And then it disappears in the third section when Bond is Bond talks about the, I would say, the composite element of the travelogue and of the mountainside that the mountain is not merely about the river and the people, that the mountain is equally about the flora, the fauna, the sights, and the sounds of the travelogue. Remember that in most cases, we have found that the travelogue is extremely, you know, site-specific in the sense that it depends largely upon the visual impact of the hills. But what Bond suggests is that apart from the visual impact, the travelogue is equally about the different senses that are associated with the travel. The other thing which I would like also to point out is how, you know, memory, memoir shapes the travelogue. And that memory is an integral part of remembering the experience and framing it into, into the text. So there are kinds of travels here which are taking place. You know, there's travel into topography. And then there's travel into history. And then there's travel into personal memory. So. When I talked about the different timelines of the travel, that of the distant past, that of the colonial past, that of Bond's past, and that of Bond's present. So these are, as it were, welded into the travelogue. And Bond's travelogue therefore talks about the importance of self and memory and the creative memory of the artist equally as the Ganga and the topography involved. So I think that is a fascinating aspect of this travelogue. Now, let me just run you through the, the last chapters, as it were. And here, I, I'm afraid we will not pause much because 
there's very little to uh, actually uh, sort of read into. Bond talks about the great trees of Garhwal for the uh, in the first instance and immediately talks about the walnut tree of his compound. Right, you see how you know the empirical topography and the personal topography of space kinds of uh, sort of overlaps with each other in this particular travelogue that it is always my and the mountains. So there's a sense of, you know, intense belonging also here that Bond does not separate himself from the mountains. That like colonial memory, his memory, his personality is also grafted into the body of the Himalayas as it were. So he talks about the walnut tree and he says that this was a tree for all seasons. In the winter, the branches were bare. And then he talks about the fruits of the walnut and the disappearing fruits of the walnut. So once again, the anecdotal pattern, right, that the travelogue is, as it were, interspersed with personal anecdotes. These are actually moments. You see, it's important to understand what the anecdote does. The anecdote is a moment of time or an experience which then radiates out to talk about the kind of uh, general existence around. So here, Bond wonders what happens to the walnuts and then suspects, say, it might be his gardener's son, it might be the monkeys, but then discovers that this, these walnuts are being stolen by a old woman who came to cut the grass on the hillside and she's nimble and she's climbed up onto the walnut tree in search of a little bit of food. So this is a comic episode that faced with Bond, the woman giggles and Bond says to the victor, the spoils. But the anecdote, while it is humorous, once again points to a running theme in the narrative that the mountain existence for these people are extremely harsh and that, you know, every little scrap of food that they find, as we've seen, is to be, you know, fought tooth and nail for, scavenged as it were. Remember the boy who walks 10 miles here and 10 miles there to attend the school and the only food that he can source on his way are the wild berries. So the walnut tree, as it were, belongs not only to Bond, as it were, because it is part of his campus or his complex, but the walnut tree also belongs to equally to the old woman who is a stakeholder in the hills. And then Bond will go on into the next chapter to talk about how, you know, corporate hotels are gradually taking over the land and the livelihood of these people. But I'll come to that a little later on. Let me then talk about the next tree that, you know, Bond is narrating is the king of the hills. And he talks about the Devdar, which is known as the Dujar, the Devdar, the Kelu or the Kelan. So another very interesting thing that Bond is doing here is also is bringing in the language of the hills. So the travelogue in that sense is not only a travel into territory or into experience or memory. It is also a travel into the local language. And you'll remember that how Bond has actually talked about the mountain hare and how it is known in the local language, how, you know, the trees, the buses are named in the local dialect. So in that sense, you know, travel is also about a process of acculturation. And that acculturation is not in only in terms of the people, in terms of the vegetation or the flowers. It is also an acculturation of familiarization with the language. Right. So Devdar, eh, Devdaru is the divine tree. It is a sacred tree in the Himalayas, not worshipped, not protected in the way that the people is in the plains, but sacred in that its timber has always been used in temples, for doors, windows, and walls. 
and he's talking about the ways in which you know mountains have generated their own uh, you know modes of construction so that these have to be you know very solid houses which have to have adequate protection against earthquakes and again they may, can be dismantled and mantled with ease because the earthquakes and the floods are very familiar now he then talks about the deodar and its girth he talks about the 15 20 feet girth the height of the deodar as having risen to almost 250 and he suggests that you know these details this is an interesting point which you need also to talk about that bond is also writing this uh, travelogue not only for the people uh, who want to learn about him but equally about to learn about the facts of the mountain so there's a distinct amount of factuality which is blended with personal reminiscence so he talks about the height of each hill station of each of the panchakedars he talks about the girth of the you know the tree uh, beneath which shankaracharya had worshipped he talks about the average width and the height of the deoda and then this chapter has a very interesting last passage these conclusions in bond are very interesting he says to return to my own trees so there is a sense of belonging and ownership of the place now, you see, ownership might be in terms of plundering, scavenging, exploiting the forest. Bond has a different sense of ownership. It's based on belonging and coexistence. And that is a very important statement that Bond is making. That the question of sustainability and participation of the stakeholder. Now, you see, very interestingly, you can study the environment, you can study eco-criticism, which is, you know, being taught to you in various guises and theories. You can teach eco-criticism in terms of theory, but it will hardly matter. And Bond's audience is, of course, one part of the audience is children. So how can Bond inculcate the sense of the relationship with nature? And Bond does it in a very simple style by inculcating a language of partnership, ownership, and sensitization. So he talks about the forest as his own. At the same time, he recognizes that the forest is much more powerful and long withstanding than him. The forest is part of an eternal time, whereas he belongs to a very finite time. So the first element is to reverse this man-nature relationship of power. He suggests that nature is infinitely more resilient and powerful than man. Secondly, the point that he's making is that this tree does not belong only to him. It also belongs to all the people of this particular area. So the sense of partnership the sense of community to which the forest belongs. And the third thing he does is ironically refers to the ways in which the forests are being denuded and therefore, you know, environmental crisis is happening. So Bond's environmentalism or Bond's ecological consciousness is extremely subtle and underplayed rather than talk in very direct terms he is inculcating this nature awareness among the children, right? And therefore, he talks about the trees. I went among them often, acknowledging their presence with the touch of my hand. So another very interesting thing happens here is introducing this element of not only sight, sound, hearing. He's also introducing this element of touching the tree like you would touch a man or a woman against the trunks the walnuts smooth and polished the pines patterned and world the oaks rough gnarled full of experience so it's very interesting in the sense that bond has this particular one-to-one -one relationship the sense of kinship 
and identification with every single tree on the mountain. Therefore, he knows, he feels them, right? And it is in this sense that he'll find almost a kind of a Wordsworthian attachment with a tactile attachment with nature that Bond enjoys, right? And then he talks about the pine uh, tree, the chur, the Himalayan blue pine. And he talks about the mellow song of a pygmy owlet. And then Bond is moving to this question of the sound, which will again become a theme for the next paragraph as well. He talks about the some sounds which cannot be recognized. They're very interesting, the strange night sounds, the sounds of the trees themselves stretching their limbs in the dark, shifting a little, flexing their fingers. Great trees of the mountains, they know me well. They know my face in the window. They see me watching them, watching them grow, listening to their secrets, bowing my head before their outstretched arms and seeking their benediction. So the strange inner life of the forest, that is what Bond seems to suggest, a mysterious, a sublime, life that the forest itself has. And that is privy only to those who can open their heart and ears to the forest. So the sense of belonging, the sense of penetrating the language of the forests is something that Bond is talking about. Now, you see, it's interesting that we generally consider the river and the you know, snow-capped peaks to be sublime. Bond is suggesting that the entire topography of the forest, trees, birds, etc., adds to this sublimity. We talked about the many rivers forming the Ganga, didn't we? Bond is suggesting that the forest, that this Uttarakhand, that this land of heaven, is because of the combination, not only of the Ganga, but also of the trees, the forests, the flora, the fauna, the bird songs, sounds, fields, and therefore Bond is largely talking, as you can now understand what I'm leading to, of the ecosystem of the river and the forest, within which he sees, you know, man as an interloper, you know, modern man as an interloper, the, the forester or the local resident has amalgamated himself within this ecosystem. But the modern man is an encroacher into this ecosystem. And we'll look at how that happens in a subsequent chapter. But the next chapter talks about it. In fact, this chapter only talks about the bird songs in the hills. So he's talked about touch. Now he'll talk about the sounds of the birds. And he says, few birds remain silent and one learns of their presence from the calls of songs. Bird song is with you wherever you go into the hills from the foothills to the tree line. So an integral part. So the sound of the river, as well as the sound of the forest, as well as the sound of the birds, these are three composite parts of the forest ecosystem. So what are the birds that he talks about? He talks about the barbet, for example, the pew pew uh, 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 call of the bar barbet. And uh, he, he compares it with Another anecdote, a local story, that the barbet is actually a money lender who has died, whose loans are not paid. So he cries, e now, e now, or anyai, anyai, in the sense that this is an injustice, that his money is not being paid. So once again, Bond is weaving into the tapestry of this travelogue, local legends, local stories, local anecdotes, local ghosts, colonial ghosts, and so on and so forth. Right. <clears throat> Once again, this forest is essentially human and a treasure trove, a trove of stories also. So the barbet is one uh, a very important bar bird here that he talks about. And then he talks about the green-backed tit. He talks about the Hodgson's gray-headed flycatcher warbler. And then he talks about the night jars. Uh, he talks about the sunbird, the owl, which is called the kastura or the kasturi, the whistling thrust of the Himalayas. 
thrush of the Himalayas, I'm sorry. And therefore, he suggests that every single part of the forest and that the forest is not an uniform body of trees, that the forest, the vegetation changes and so does the bird song. So he talks about coming to the foothills and hearing the cuckoo and uh, the dove, the kokla, the green pigeon and so on and so forth. And then uh, he is, he goes on about the song of the whistling thrush. And then he uh, talks about how, you know, the legend of the whistling thrush or the kastura was born and that Lord Krishna's flute was stolen by uh, the uh, by by a small boy who played it and then lord krishna in his anger transformed this young boy into the bird and the bird retains some of the notes of lord krishna so these local legends are woven into the the travelogue once again let me suggest that the travelogue is talking about eternal time that legend mountain which is eternal which which Time cannot really calculate, right? So that, and, and he's talking about the Hindu legends with a certain amount of detachment, of course, but no criticism, right? And then uh, there is this element that he's gone away from his house for some time, and there is a nest on the windowsill, which, of course, he cannot disturb. And many of you come from, you know, houses where in the, in the, in villages or small towns, I will remember that, you know, we, we used to stay at Durgapur, which was also a very green city at that point of time. And that very frequently, you know, there would be uh, birds which would lay, which would make nests on, on window tops. And I remember that, you know, my mother never would allow us to destroy the nest because uh, she felt that, you know, it would uh, bring a curse on the house. And just sort of filtered down to us also. So that at Shantiniketan in our house, whenever there's a there's a nest of a bird, we do not allow it to be disturbed. So bond is, you know, these are these are things that are passed on from generation to generation, stories, legends, practices, so that man and the and the bird can coexist uh, simultaneously in harmony. Right? That is what he's always trying to suggest. And then he talks about the fly catchers and so on and so forth, right? So this is the song of the birds, the different birds, the color of the birds that makes up or adds up to the color of the hills. Bond is talking about the sight and the sound creating this and touch as creating this form of the synesthetic appeal of the forests in general. Now, the next chapter is titled Early Plant Collectors. And Bond in this particular chapter talks about the colonial botanists who've added to the knowledge system about the hills. Who does he talk about? He talks about the travelers and botanists from Europe. He starts with Thomas Bogle, who traveled through Bhutan, William Kitch Kirkpatrick, 1793, who travels to Nepal, and Thomas Hardwick in 1796 who travels to Srinagar in Kashmir and he talks about Hardwick and Claude Marty and their work in the northwestern Himalayas and their you know publications in the Asiatic researches in 1799. He then moves on to through this colonial history to William Spencer Webb an officer of engineers and a surveyor who actually sort of, uh, with his local companions, uh, explored the flora and the fauna of the Garhwal region. And then he talks about William Moorcraft, who was actually a veterinary officer. And he uh, sort of talks about his work in the Manasar Manasarovar ranges. Then he talks about the people who specifically worked at Dehradun. And he talks about the visit of Lord uh, Hastings and the uh, creation of a botanical garden, uh, the Najib Uddalla Garden of Zabita Khan. He talks about William Spencer Webb, Alexander Gerard, uh, 
Patrick Gerard, on which whose names very often the names of the trees were uh, named. He talks about Quiver, the, uh, the French botanist. He talks about the ja uh, Jacquemont, another French uh, botanist. Uh, and the relationship between, you know, the study of botany in colonial Calcutta and the study of botany in the hills. And also, he talks about General Allard, who had this passion for, you know, botany, and he uh, found the flora and the fauna, and he documented them. Now, he talks about the fact that not all these early plant collectors, and that is the conclusion that I'm reading, were botanists. But the spirit of inquiry was common to all of them. They were seekers of knowledge. And there were many like Jacquemont who were prepared to risk their health and even their lives in the pursuit of knowledge. So the point remains that in this particular segment, Ruskin Bond is once again going back to the colonial history. Right? You remember there was an entire passage about how Musori was laid by an Englishman. And then he talks about Jim Corbett. He talks about the people and the administrators who have added and become legendary in the history of these hill stations. And then he equally talks about the botanists who have preserved, documented, and found these, discovered these various flora and the fauna. So Bond is once again going back to this idea that he's an Indian not because of race and, and uh, or, or in terms of power, but also in terms of history. And that, you know, if there is this history of an eternal time of legend, of Hindu uh, Vedic traditions, then there is equally part and parcel of that uh, Indian tradition is the colonial time and the contribution made, contribution made by these colonial uh, travelers, these colonial botanists. So Bond seems to suggest that if there is a Mandakini of eternal time, a Bhagirathi of eternal time, then there is equally an Alakananda of colonial time that has added up to the composite sense of existence of the colonial, uh, of, these, uh, of these locations of the hills. And that without this colonial history, the hills can never really be read or understood. So in that sense, Bond is talking about, not talking about the segregation of these lands into just pilgrimages, but also the mountain as a gigantic ecosystem, which the colonial historians and botanists have tried to perceive and protect, right? And then comes two uh, very interesting chapters, uh, the concluding chapters of the book. He, he titles this the white greens and the green white clouds and the green mountains. He talks about a particular time. You remember this is written in October, late September, early October, which Bond says is the best time for the mountains because the rains have gone and the white clouds have come out and there are waterfalls all around. And he talks now about the flowers and the ferns which make up this valley, wild ginger, clematis, clusters of yarrow, ladies' mountains, aroids. And this one particular flower that he says is very colorful and takes his breath away, and that is the comelina. And the way in which Bond stands before the first comelina and worships it because of its bright blue azure color. Now, this then makes way in the next section. And this is very interesting. The next section about the cut from Bond's personal world to the actual modern present day world of modernity. Right. So Bond has been talking about, as I said, four times the ancient Vedic Hindu mountain time, which is eternal which you cannot really date. Then comes the colonial time, which is vital for the discovery of these territories and the protection of the flora and the fauna. 
He then talks about his personal memory time of the Dehra that he used to know. And then comes the modern present day time, which encroaches, which is this particular Anthropocene, which encroaches violently upon the natural topography and memory like a stranger, an interloper, as it were. And how does it enter? From the silence of the hills, you have the binary of the blare of a truck's horn, a cloud of dust and blasts of diesel fumes are funder, further indications that reality takes many different forms. Even my Comelina seems to shrink from the onslaught. So there's a distinct past and a present. And the present is marked by the rape of the forests almost by construction, buildings, and cement. And he says, what did Aunt Ruby say? Uh, stand still for five minutes and they will build a hotel on top of you. Now, I know that there are many of you from the hills here. And you'll remember, you must have talked to your parents and grandparents about the mall of Darjeeling or the various locations of Kersiong, even places like Rishop and so on and so forth, which were more pristine. And how, you know, everyday hotels are coming up and encroaching upon nature and transforming the topography of the landscape. Right. So he then evokes Lot's wife. And uh, when she looks back upon her native land, you know, she's transformed into a pillar of salt. Similarly, pillars seem to be coming up all over the mountains. And he says, I have an uneasy feeling that I'll be turned into a pillar of cement if I look back. So I plod along the road to Devasari, a kindly village. And in contrast to these, you know, urban hotels that transform and pollute the topography of the hills, he then posits as its antithesis the kind of the old quaint tea shop, which is hospitable, which is eco-friendly, and which can provide, you know, both refreshment and shelter to the people. So in that sense, Bond is acutely aware in the travelogue of the modernity that is encroaching on the hills and the Ganga that is being gradually bounded in by civilization, which is manifested in his description of the Tehri Dam, which, uh, you know, cuts off an entire city and tries to dam the rivers of the Ganga. Right, so that is the travelogue then, and then we come to the last chapter, which I think is significant. So I've sort of reserved for some time for it. Now, in the last chapter, Bond goes back. He had started from Dehra, if you remember. The first uh, chapter was called The Writer on the Hill, and he talked about uh, Dehra and Musori. And he goes back to Dehra once again, but this is through memory, the Dehra I know. And he talks about the three Dehras that he knew. First is as a childhood when he stayed with his grandmother. You know, the Dehra of my school days when I used to come home for the holidays to stay with my uh, mother and the, my uh, stepfather until he leaves for England. So this is the Dehra of his, of his childhood days, right? Which is this quaint little town with very few people, enormous trees, and forests. And then he talks about his London time, his writing, The Room on the Roof, which most of you have read. And uh, then he talks about how the innocence of Dehra actually sort of was translated into the innocence of The Room on the Roof, and how most of his stories, his writings have generated from the people and the topography that he knew. Right. And then he talks about uh, his return to India at the age of 22 and his living and scrounging for a living as a writer, living on the top of uh, his stepfather's former wife's uh, shop, BBG shop. And he says this was a room with very little amenities, a small room where you had no electricity and used to write with uh, candlelight. And he finds that very romantic. And he says, I was happy cooking up stories most of them written after dark by the night of a kerosene lantern. And 
He says, I was quite content to live by candlelight or lamplight. It led to a romantic grow to my early writing life. And then he recounts through memory his writing of the stories of Deoli, Dilram Bazaar, romantic episodes in Shamli, Bijnor. And he talks about the Paltan Bazaar, the Dalanwala, the tea gardens. And he says, you know, how does a writer write? So the travelogue now, you know, it goes back to the memory of his writing rather than the topography. And he says that the atmosphere of the place comes through quite strongly in his stories. When a writer looks back at a particular place or period in his life, he tries to capture the essence of the place and the experience. So you see, it's very interesting that the travel travelogue starts off with his memories of childhood and a writer on the hill, his identity as a writer, it's coming back to his identity as a writer and his creativity. So we were talking in our early theoretical classes on travel writing about how the traveler is essentially writing himself rather than write the place. So Bond is also in this particular travelogue, and we talked about how the travelogue is really in the form of a memoir and the presence of the self becomes very important. And this is probably a question that may be asked to you for the final examinations as well as to how does a traveler, travelogue writer sort of put his selfhood into travel writing or what is the relationship between the self and travel writing. So this is a particularly good example that Bond suggests that writing about travel is also writing about his self. Writing about the journey in the mountains and of the Ganga flowing is also a journey about his self from uh, you know, young youth to adulthood. And then he talks about his self, uh, his, his stepfather and so on and so forth. And he talks about his Dera stories as, uh, as having generated his characters. And so Granny was real, of course. Uh, so were the boys in the room and vagrants. But did Rusty make love to Meena Kapoor? It's a question which I have often been asked and must remain un unanswered. It might have happened. Then again, it might have not. I prefer to leave it as a sweet mystery that will never be solved, like the mystery of the mountains that you can perceive, but you can never really stop or solve. Right. And then he suggests that it is the ambience of the place, something about it that suited my temperament. So the making of the writer, you know, this journey has been about traveling through the Ganga, imbibing the place, but it's also a journey about the making of the writer, about how the place seems to permeate his writings. And then he closes uh, with the reference to a blue wind called Blue Mint, and it grows in ditches and neglected gardens. It's nearly there all the year round and is associated with Dera. This is one plant that will never go extinct. It refuses to go away. So the third Dehra that he's talking about is the Dehra of now, which is a cosmopolitan urban jungle. But he says that the spirit of this hill station, the spirit of the mountain, and the spirit of his younger days, the memories of the Dehra that he knew, will never go away. I've known it since I was a boy. And as long as it's there, I shall know that a part of me still lives in Dehra. So ultimately, this travelogue is not really about the river Ganga or Musori or Dehradun. It is about Ruskin Bond and his perception of the place. It is about the journey of a self through its memories, through its territories, to understand how the mountains, how the people of the mountains, how his ambience has shaped him as a writer. So as much as a journey of the Ganga, or as much as a journey across the Ganga, this is a journey across the people, the place, the sound, the flora, and the fauna that make up Ruskin Bond. It is a journey into selfhood in many ways. So finally, let me wind up this discussion on Ruskin Bond. You know, we started off with this idea of Ruskin Bond's identity and this 
very strange identity that he has of being both an insider, is born and brought up here, is part of the place, he knows the mountains intimately, he knows the places, the people, is aware of the tribulations, is aware of the difficulties. So he's an insider into the place. At the same time, as a non-Hindu and as an Anglo-Indian, he is also given a kind of a unique external perspective through which he can look as an observer into the legends, myths, and the people and the modernity with a certain amount of detachment, right? But please remember that in Bond, it's very important to understand that he does not look at these with critical judgment. He's sympathetic and neutral. Only when it does come to this desecration of the forest and the environment and the transformation of the topography into ugliness, does Bond create a kind of a mild, ironic, satirical tone. Otherwise, you know, this rambling kind of sort of narrative has a structure of beginning with his own territory, his own topography in Missouri as a writer in the hill, then traveling up the hill and understanding the people who will now uh, sort of provide him with the grist of his stories and then coming back to his own memory as a source of his creativity. So it starts off with Dera and Musori, comes back to Musori, having traveled with the Ganga. So in a certain sense, you will find that the Ganga is not important. In, 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 although it's part and parcel, the central theme of this narrative, of this travel narrative, it is about the forest as an ecosystem and how a writer sort of creates a systemic body of literature out of this ecosystem of the forest. What role does memory have to play? What role does observation have to play? What role does the people have to play? What role does the ecological consciousness of Bond have to play? What role does his identity have to play? And what role does his perspective of the people have to play? These are issues that Bond actually probes in all roads lead to the Ganga. And finally, we must also talk about this notion of bond of time that, you know, just like many rivers make up the Ganga, the bond seems to suggest that the forest is made up of many kinds of time, eternal time of nature, the ancient time of the Vedas and the awareness of the, Krish of the Hindu pilgrims, right? He talks about the pilgrimage as uplifting, as symbolic, as some sublime and the pilgrimage of the earlier age. He then talks about the colonial time and the role that the colonizers have made in discovering these places, inhabiting these places, studying the local flora and the fauna, contributing to the people of these places. And he suggests that there's a body of beneficial people who've added to uh, the riches of these places. And that colonial time is as much part of these territories. And then he talks about the modern times where, you know, gradually the Musori and the Dehra of his past is obliterated by more aggressive, acquisitive, modern, restraining civilizational features of a post-independence India, which in many cases he sees as directly contravening the environment of, of the period. But triumphing about all these themes is his personal history with the place, his unique relationship, his story of growth, his story of belonging to the forest, knowing the forest and its people, and growing as a, as a literary figure. So the contribution that the Ganga, the ecosystem of the forests, and Dehra has made to his body of, as a writer, is something that Bond seems to journey across. Now, almost all his texts, his 
non-fictional texts in that sense, his memoirs, are journeys into his selfhood and growth as a writer. And therefore, if all roads lead to the Ganga is a travelogue about traveling through the hills, it is equally about traveling through his creative personality. And it is in this intimate blending between the self and the travel that you see the impact of the traveling, travel writing lies. And that is what I intended to highlight before you, right? And that, you know, this becomes a kind of a pilgrimage text without really a sense of a pilgrimage. So there's the sense of how pilgrims travel, the sense of uh, <coughs> a kind of uh, the search for symbolic meaning and sublimity. At the same time, Bond suggests that there are alternative versions of this sublimity through physical delight, through the knowledge of the people. And once again, there's this small irony that the Ganga really does not matter for these people because it's not the river which matters to them, it's the rains. The Ganga is a source of sustenance in a different way in that you know it's a source of tourism and therefore life. But at the same time, this tourism is eating away into the kind of environmental uh, coherence that man had with them. Right, so these are the issues that I think are important for all roads lead to the Ganga. Let me uh, uh, take you uh, through your questions then. Shorab has uh, sort of talks about Bond's perspective of nature. Is, based, is it based on the Western notion of deep ecology or is it based on third world environmentalism which tends to deny the notion of deep ecology or is it moving between the two? Uh, you see, once again, I, I have a little bit of a hesitation because Bond quite clearly does not want to be mired into these theoretical debates. Now, uh, Bond, of course, uh, there is this suggestion of the deep ecology in the sense that, you know, uh, as a writer, he understands that uh, the Dehra that he knew and the writer that he has become was shaped by a particular ecological uh, ecological dimension or a particular ecological state which then provoked his state of being and therefore in many ways he is uh, he is reluctant to let go of that memory right he's reluctant to let go of that memory so in that sense there is probably a sense of deep ecology within bond's writings but, uh, and, and I, I don't think really that, you know, Bond is an environmentalist in the sense of an activist. And so whatever he does is also done very, very subtly. He, he shows his disapproval, but there's no, you know, there's this sense of being the observer rather than the activist. So I wouldn't hesitate to use the word third world environmentalism with a reference to Bond. Whatever uh, is there is there through a bit of irony and a sarcasm rather than any very direct environmentalist statement. So you'll have to keep that in mind, Shorab, when you are uh, reading this text. Uh, once again, uh, let me remind you that this is the only travelogue that we've read really, which is meant for a younger audience. And therefore, you know, Bond is just alerting their sensitivities to these uh, to these problematics rather than engaging into a full fledged debate on uh, or a kind of a direct statement on um, the uh, on, 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 on the environment. But this deep ecology and how it fashions uh, a human or a creative artist is something which I think is interesting to look at. And that's a good question, Shorab. Thank you very much for it. Uh, I would say uh, you you are, of course, talking about uh, the third world environmentalism because we often see uh, modern man encroaching slowly and thus haunts with a fear of exploitation. Yes, there is that, of course. And there's this sense of discomfort that Bond has that this is entirely, you know, taken over uh, by 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 development and so on and so forth. But uh, somehow, you know, that 
the, 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 when, when Bond is talking about this sense of, you know, identification with the flowers uh, and uh, the, the bark of the trees, I would rather uh, sort of gravitate towards this idea of a deep ecology, although maybe uh, we can both of us agree on a neutral ground that there are concerns of both. But please remember that these are not theoretically or very powerfully ground out in the text. Right. So uh, uh, two interesting questions that Shorab is reading. Uh, obviously, Shorab has read it through the prism of environmental theory. And that's one way in which you can take a look at Ruskin Bond. Now, the other question is put by Ruskin uh, Shamorpon. Shamorpon is writing uh, Ruskin Bond, a person, the perfect example of, uh, I'm sorry, just let me uh, say, example of what Mary Louis Pratt calls the contact zone. Not really, uh, Shamorpon. I have deliberately, if you found, not used the term contact zone in this particular uh, text. You know, it's because uh, Asymmetrical power conditions that uh, Mary Louis Pratt talks about uh, is not really present in the in the in the text. And um, since I I don't read too much into the political of uh, of political aspect of the text, uh, rather I would like to see this in terms of the memoir. And also, it's very interesting to observe what Bond's position is. So, uh, you know, reading it through the contact zone might be slightly difficult, uh, as it were. Uh, there's somebody called Davida Shen, but I don't think she's put a question here. Hoimanti, of course, has. And Hoimanti has a question saying, is it the influence of romanticism that always fascinates Ruskin Bond to include nature and natural essence, not only in this travelogue, but in most of his writings? That's a good question. Yes, uh, Bond, and Bond has written that he's been greatly inspired by the romantics and uh, by the Victorians who were continuing the romantic tradition in many ways. So this this spontaneous, you know, uh, kind of a uh, identification with nature. And you remember that there he talks about his childhood being spent in that, you know, tamarind tree where he sort of uh, interacts with insects and so on. So the shaping of uh, the childhood through nature is a theme that uh, is uh, is significantly romantic within Bond, but also there's this uh, and there's this hostility, or uh, we'll not call it hostility, but there's this disapproval of the encroaching city, which gradually eats up the memories of his of his childhood, the importance of memory in the creation of his writings. So there there is a lot of the romantic uh, uh, sort of influence that goes into the making of Bond. Uh, I, I am quite, I'm quite sure about that. So, Imunti, you have a point, and uh, therefore I, I take away two very good questions: one by Shorab and the other by Hoimanti. Shomorpon's question is also relevant, but I do not really agree with what Shomorpon is saying. I, I am therefore a little hesitant using the term um, "contact zone" with reference to Ruskin Bond. Maybe uh, in a final class. Uh, where I can have you in a Google Meet session rather than in a YouTube session, we can uh, discuss uh, some of these problems uh, before your internal examination happens uh, live so that we have a more, uh, more open forum for discussion. Right then. Well, that is then Ruskin Bond's All Roads to the Ganga. With that, we come to the end of what has been a rather fascinating course on travel writing. We've talked about the theory of travel writing, perspectives of travel writing. We have talked about early colonial travel writing uh, through the writings of uh, Abu Talib. Uh, it was a fascinating journey to see him uh, talk about technology and uh, the, the reception and the, the circulation of that travel writing. We've taken to the small towns of India with uh, Vishwanath Ghosh in Chai Chai. And we've also uh, sort of looked at uh, the kind of traveling in the forest, uh, in the mountains, and as a pilgrimage, which is not a pilgrimage really in Ruskin Bond. You have, of course, traveled to Europe with the Pankorda in Rabindranath's uh, <coughs> Europe, uh, Europe Prabhashit Patro.
and Anunna is taking you on a woman's trek through India through Madhu Veena. So all in all, I uh, thank all of you for having participated very enthusiastically in this course. I'm, of course, still to yet to hear from Ruskin Bond. If I do hear from him, I will uh, sort of uh, try and arrange a kind of a Google Meet with him. If not, we'll have to now focus our attention to the internals, which will be held on the 22nd at 10 o'clock as usual. Uh, and where I will sort of put general questions which might involve all the three texts that I have taught. There will be options, of course. You'll have to answer one of the two questions that are given. So I hope you've enjoyed uh, sort of doing this course as much as I have enjoyed interacting with you. Thank you for being here. And with that, let me close the teaching component of this course. Have a good day, everybody. And I hope all the best for your uh, internal examinations on the 22nd. Thank you again.